Good afternoon, and welcome to HIT Policy Update with John Halanka, MD, CIO at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, a complimentary webinar from HealthSystemCIO.com sponsored by On Base by Highland. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. I'm the moderator. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the editor-in-chief of HealthSystemCIO.com. We encourage you to ask questions. Very good topic for it. Uh, go ahead and type them in as they occur to you in the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and leave the default set to all panelists and we'll be posing them later in the program. You can download the deck. I did send it out in the chat box. It's in front of you and you have a shortened slide deck URL at the bottom of each slide. So plenty of chances to get the deck. And we are recording this event, so we'll be creating an archive that we'll post to our YouTube channel within two business days, if not sooner, and you'll receive an email when it's ready. So you're going to see how we're going to spend our time today. We're going to go about 45 minutes. First, we're going to hear from Dr. Halamka. Then we're going to hear from our sponsor, represented by Lorna Green, Healthcare Executive Advisor with On Base by Highland. And then we'll have our Q&A. So without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to our good friend, Dr. John Halamka. Dr. Halamka, thanks for joining us again. Well, very happy to be here. And of course, especially on this particularly auspicious day, the day before ICD-10 goes live. And so, as we all know, the, the world might end. We just had a super moon with an eclipse. And in case anyone wonders, should there be meteor showers that destroy our health IT systems because of the super moon, there is an ICD-10 code for that. That's V95.41. So uh, let us get started with our update. I'm sure on everybody's mind is what's going on with Meaningful Use Stage 2 amendments and the Stage 3 final rule. Uh, I try to get as much information as I can out of our friends in the executive branch and the legislative branch, and it's a murky picture. Uh, I'll just tell you everything that I know. We all know that Meaningful Use Stage 2 reporting period begins very soon, and therefore we really need clarity on what is the meaningful use final amended rule for stage two. Only 12% of clinicians and 40% of hospitals have achieved meaningful use as currently written, so I think there's a lot of desire among eligible professionals and hospitals to see revisions to that rule so that they can do the right thing. They can achieve better interoperability and quality and safety and efficiency but do it in a way that allows phased progress. So I have one member of our executive branch that's told me, oh, on Friday we will see the Meaningful Use Stage 2 final information. But yet, yesterday, Lamar Alexander, the chair of the Senate Health Committee, sent a letter to Secretary Burwell saying two things. Urgently, please release the Meaningful Use Stage 2 final rule and please do not move forward with Meaningful Use Stage 3 until January 1, 2017 at the very earliest. How is it we can create a Stage 3 when only 12% of doctors have achieved Stage 2? Don't you think we need to amend Stage 2 first, see how it goes, and then move on to Stage 3? And of course, such things as patient family engagement and interoperability we know are critically important, but if clinicians aren't able to even do 5% of their patients doing secure email exchange or 5% of their patients looking at their data, how could we possibly achieve the 35% that has been suggested in Stage 3? So, of course, in the notice of proposed rulemaking, Stage 2 revisions would include such things as, well, demonstrate that at least one patient can do it, that you have the technical capability in the real world of delivering and executing on this functionality. So we'll see. You know, I think it's just the overwhelming sentiment that I hear from the AMA, the AHA, from Congress, is that stage two, clarity and simplification is a very immediate priority, and stage three just needs more time. Rushing it is not going to achieve a better result. And as written, remember the meaningful use stage three proposed rule, there were two of them the certification rule of 431 pages, and the CMS meaningful use rule of some 300 pages, the certification rule had so much material in it that the vendors providing EHR software would have their agendas co-opted for the next couple of years 
with all the optional certification possibilities in that rule. And it's pretty clear if we want to achieve innovation, if we want usability, if we want to enhance security, co-opting the vendor's agenda with a huge amount of optional certification activities, not the greatest idea. And, you know, to be honest, the CMS rule was actually pretty well written for meaningful use at a station. It's just that the goals were a little too aggressive. So let's get through stage two, let's learn some lessons, let's refine those goals and numbers, and then move forward. So I think we can assume that meaningful use stage three you know, wouldn't take effect until 2018 at the earliest. And, you know, I do expect that there is going to be delay and revision given all the letters from Congress and certainly the objections of many private societies. So one other qualifier for meaningful use, I was in a meeting the other day where I was saying, doesn't everybody want meaningful use as a program basically to end? I heard two things. First, the Medicaid recipients say, well, remember, Medicaid recipients get paid whether or not they achieve certain milestones or not. And so actually the Medicaid program was meant to help subsidize the acquisition of the technology itself as opposed to the Medicare program that was to reward you for achieving a certain result. So our Medicaid firms, our Medicaid providers and institutions actually would like the Meaningful Use program to continue so their cash to buy technology continues. It's also been pointed out that the sustainable growth rate fix, which we saw a few months ago, includes a notion of moving Medicare reimbursement, at least 25% of it, from fee-for-service to global capitated risk by 2018. And of course, one asks the question, if the kind of IT you need to keep people well includes buying your patients Apple Watches, monitoring their exercise, their heart rates, their blood pressure, their glucometer, and trying to actually look for gaps in care using population health techniques, well, that's really not in meaningful use. So is the meaningful use program, which was foundational and good, really aligned with where Medicare reimbursement changes are going? And if it's not, maybe we should fix that. And maybe the Medicare motivator is more potent than the meaningful use program at getting us to adopt new and innovative IT and ultimately to reduce costs and redundancy. So there we go, you know, hopefully we'll see meaningful use stage two revisions, maybe as early as Friday, stage three, we'll hopefully see some delays, but hopefully Medicaid firms will still get their monies to keep adopting EHR technology. And we might see the Medicare folks using the merit-based payment system the MIPS system as part of a whole constellation of pay for performance programs, putting some meaningful use criteria as just yet another pay for performance item. And that way try to align this move from fee for service to global capitated risk and various other kinds of merit based incentives in a single program. So that's the meaningful use update. Now, Next slide is about precision medicine. So what is precision medicine? And the example I will give you from my wife, who's given, of course, complete HIPAA permission for me to tell you this, is when she was diagnosed with stage 3A breast cancer in December of 2011, she's Asian female, age 50, had a certain genomic character to her tumor, a certain genomic character to her body, and the question, of course, is of all the treatments and protocols that could be given to a breast cancer patient, what do other patients like her have to teach us? If you've had 10,000 Asian females with stage 3A breast cancer and they've had a multitude of treatments, some of which has worked, some of which has not, some of which has caused side effects, shouldn't that inform the next patient you treat? So Obama launched this precision medicine initiative, and uh, certainly the folks at ONC are very focused on the standards that are necessary to support precision medicine. ONC did actually a very good job at our last standards committee meeting, recognizing that if you're going to identify standards that are necessary for the medical record, for genomics, for tailoring therapy to an individual person, some of our standards are ready, some are promising, some are not ready at all, may not exist or need a lot further development. 
So what they did is they classified the needs for data standards to support precision medicine, and then they classified their maturity. And that gives us, in a sense, a roadmap as we, over the next couple of years, will build new capabilities into our EHRs and clinical trial systems as to what standards to choose. And we'll avoid inventing a lot of new standards if there are promising standards on the horizon, but we'll certainly acknowledge the true gaps. So in some ways, since meaningful use, as we've talked about, is a bit murky, it's this precision medicine initiative that may be the new organizing principle, the new rubric that we use as we start to develop more interoperability standards for the country. And let me just show you an example. Um, as ONC starts to think about standards to recommend, I mean, there's two ways they can recommend them. They can write regulation like the Meaningful Use Certification Rule, which then causes vendors to have to do a lot of implementation and testing and deployment, or they can issue sub-regulatory guidance and say, you know, if you have a use case where you need to exchange a patient transition of care summary with a skilled nursing facility, you know, here's the best standard to do that and here's its level of adoption and maturity. Is there a testing tool? Is there an implementation guide? And so now a developer can actually look at non-regulatory standards advice across a multitude of use cases and say, oh yeah, there is a standard for that. And actually you can see it's pretty well adopted. It's, it's pretty well along and, and there's a tool for it. And so you'll see this Standards Advisory, which was formally published by ONC last week for 2016, includes uh, about 20 pages or so of various standards for various use cases. Each has been scored and ranked, and we're now in a 60-day comment period on that, so I would certainly encourage you to look at the ONC 2016 Standards Advisory. Yeah, that work supports precision medicine, and it supports in general the entire interoperability agenda moving forward. Now, also out of ONC in the last week has been the strategic plan for the country. So it's a five-year strategic plan. I've included the URL on the slide. It covers 2015 through 2020, and it outlines the major issues that the Obama administration has chosen to focus on. As you can see, it's some things that I think all of us would probably agree are important. That is, instead of maximizing data flows within a siloed institution, we actually want to make sure that we aggregate data around the person for their whole life in all their settings of care, and that we make that data available to the patients so they can see it as well as contribute to it. And the example from me is that I was recently diagnosed with hypertension and the question, of course, was, was my hypertension caused by a mass pike commute, drinking too much green tea, or my boss? And the only way to actually figure this out would be for me using technologies like a wireless blood pressure cuff and my phone to measure my blood pressure successfully during the day and determine if there was a correlation between blood pressure elevation and an event. And I did that for several days, and we actually figured out the nature of my blood pressure was actually caused by my parents because they have high blood pressure and their parents had high blood pressure. It just took 53 years for me to catch up to essential hypertension, a genetic cause of hypertension. So that's the sort of idea, more and more patients' engagement and patient-centered care. Of course, we want to make sure that care is delivered at the right facility for the right level of acuity and that there's appropriate data sharing across primary care, specialists, urgent care, hospitals, tertiary, and community. That data with patient consent is contributed to clinical trials, clinical research, so that we can now have a learning healthcare system, and just as the example of my wife, be able to offer to every patient a sense of what has happened in the past, what has been successful and not. And of course, my wife is fully cured and doing well, and much of the data that she needed to understand her treatment was accessible from the Harvard hospitals. That should be available at all hospitals. 
To make all this happen, of course, there is some element of infrastructure. We need to make sure that there's broadband everywhere, that there's fiber laid, that every doctor's office and healthcare facility has a strong internet connection and is capable of getting to these educational resources and databases and uh, decision support tools. So that's more of an FCC issue, but it's, again, part of a whole federal plan. Well, at the same time, the executive branch is busy thinking about standards, advice, and a five-year plan, Congress is very frustrated. $31 billion has been spent through the uh, stimulus program of high tech, and the stories that you'll hear in Congress are, well, I took my daughter to the doctor, and the doctor didn't have all the data about her, like her immunization history for her whole life, how did we allow $31 billion to be spent, and yet there isn't ubiquitous access through a national backbone of immunization data for every person available at every doctor's office? So hence, what you're seeing is a number of bills being introduced in Congress, like the 21st Century Cures bill. You'll see another bill coming from a senator tomorrow. They're all focused on how do we encourage interoperability, and some of the approaches are a blunt instrument of legislation. We will make it illegal to not share data. And I am not convinced a blunt instrument of legislation is going to be that helpful. How about this? What if there was an objective measure of interoperability? And we didn't ask the vendors if they were interoperable. We asked the customers, we asked the nurses, the doctors, the patients to actually document their experience with data sharing. Same vendor EHR to same vendor EHR or same vendor to different vendor EHR or with critical business partners. Was the data available you needed to deliver appropriate care when you needed it? And in that way, if there's this transparent publication of each vendor's real-world experience with interoperability, that would motivate the market to actually address some of the gaps that we see today. Some of these bits of legislation include the term information blocking, and I find that term to be a bit controversial. Uh, do we really believe that vendors have chief information blocking officers who wake up every morning figuring out how to withhold data? Probably don't exist. What you see, well, in some cases, that you just don't have the sophistication in the local practice or in the vendor to achieve the interoperability that's needed. Sometimes there are economic barriers, like a cost per click to share data. Sometimes there are politics. Oh, I don't trust that practice. I'm not sure they'll keep my data safe. So what you hope as this legislation comes out from both the House and the Senate, that instead of doing something like 21st Century Cures defines interoperability as sharing every data element with every person for every purpose and makes it illegal not to, that you'll see from the Senate Help Committee or you'll see from certain senators this idea of we'll build open transparent metrics, we'll make sure that we have an appropriate policy environment for the sharing of data, we'll ensure there's enabling infrastructure, and then the information blocking issue really isn't the highlight. It's the, let's make sure it's really happening. If it's not, shine a bright light on it and make sure that all the enablers are there and the barriers are knocked down. Part of this is going to be, I think, uh, a function of the private sector. I think we're seeing a lot of our vendors fearful that they are going to be over-regulated or over-legislated the last thing they need is another thousand page document to co-opt their agenda. So, for example, CLASS, uh, who kind of the consumer reports of the healthcare IT industry, has published some reports, we'll be publishing additional reports on interoperability and who's doing what. We have this Argonaut project where private sector organizations have come together and committed to open up the databases of products like Cerner and Epic and Meditech, any clinical works in Athena and McKesson and SureScripts to create an ecosystem where an app writer could take data from a patient and put it in an EHR or take data from an EHR and show it to a patient. And that's really all private sector based. It's not regulatory. So I think 
in a strange way, you'll see the private sector vendors, the incumbents in our industry, highly motivated to demonstrate more interoperability and openness because of their fear of future overregulation, which they think will material or materially harm their business. So interesting to watch. And again, expect over the next couple of days to see more legislation in that regard. So as I do this quarterly, you know, I always tell Anthony, oh my, I expect that the next quarter will be quiet. <laughs> nothing will be going on. Nothing will be new. But here I think you've seen meaningful use in some ways being replaced by the sustainable growth rate bill, by private sector activity and new congressional activity. And interoperability is on the lips of seemingly everyone in Washington these days. We've got our meaningful use, goal one achieved, capturing data electronically. Now it's time to securely exchange it in all the ways that are necessary to deliver that safe, quality, efficient care we want. And of course, I did mention the word security. Uh, since the last time we met, there have been several dozen major privacy breaches and all the fingerprints of all the federal employees have been stolen by the Chinese. So I would say that just as CIOs, you must know, that as we share more data with more people for more purposes, our vigilance in protecting that data is just increasingly important because the bad actors on the internet are increasingly numerous. So Anthony, let me turn it back to you and Lorna, and then I look forward to Q&A. Awesome, well, wonderful presentation, invaluable, and we all appreciate it. Uh, so now it's time to hear from our, our sponsor, uh, who we very much appreciate, represented by Lorna Green, Healthcare Executive Advisor, and she is with OnBase by Highland. Lorna, good to talk to you again. Good to talk with you all, too. Thank you for having me, and thank you, as always, for that update, Dr. Halamka. You help us understand those complexities that I can't always understand. Um, and I just briefly want to, to tell you a little bit about OnBase. All right, I was just looking back at my slides. I apologize. Um, but as we know, as Dr. Halanta talked about, everyone out there is wanting data. Data is, is what we want. The patients want it, the doctors want it, the payers want it. And at OnBase, we realize that the core of your business is your EMR, whether it's Epic, Meditech, Cerner, that's where most of your data will be. But we also know there's other data that resides outside of that, and that could be your DICOM 9, DICOM images, your factors, your outside records, external labs. So our goal at OnBase and our enterprise imaging strategy is to have available ability of any medical image, anytime, anywhere, to any authorized user, which goes along with the security Dr. Halamka was talking about in the context of the patient's record. And this is your typical workflow, how many of you have now. You have multiple databases if you have a different units, you may have to log on to four different places to see all the different pieces of the patient's record. But using our on-base patient window is what we call it, we bring all that data together in a tabbed format, which is, is customizable for your organization, to bring whatever data is outside of your core EMR together in one place for your clinicians to look at. We have direct links with some of our EMRs, and with other EMRs, we can use hotkeys to bring this where your clinicians never have to use leave your main EMR. Um, I'm going to just briefly go through this because in the matter of time, but I wanted to let you know that that at OnBase, we used to be a scanning provider, but now we're realizing the importance of all the data that's out there. I just mentioned to you the OnBase patient window. We also have a medical imaging viewer that's embedded with an on-base. We have an on-base VNA where you can bring your DICOM and your non-DICOM images into one storage for your clinicians. We have a product called on-base anywhere where you can share data between on-base users. We have universal scope capture where we can bring data from scopes, pictures, and reports into on-base. And then we also have the mobile solutions where you can use those to bring in different types of data to your organization. I just wanted to um, let you know, though, as you're thinking about data, anything outside of your EMR, OnBase can handle it. So please give us a call when you're looking for other, other programs and software. Thank you. All right.
right, Lorna, thank you very much for that presentation. And again, uh, we, we really appreciate On Base by Highland sponsoring, having sponsored many of these events and sponsoring today. Uh, so with that, it's time to move to our Q&A. So as I mentioned, go ahead and send your questions in the Q&A box, leave the default set to all panelists, and we will get those questions in front of Dr. Halamka. Uh, first question, uh, can you give me some scenarios regarding what the effect will be if the OMB doesn't release or approve the Meaningful Use 2 revisions uh, until, let's say, mid-October, and then let's say November, and let's say December. I mean, what is sort of the snowballing effect? What happens out in the industry? What are the effects? All right, so I think a couple of things are true, which one assumes that the standards and the certification, that's not going to change, so therefore there isn't going to actually be any need to change or upgrade products. I mean, that would be impossible. But the criteria by which you can pass your attestation, in theory, will be reduced. And, of course, the challenge here is that if the attestation period begins in October, but the rule isn't issued until after October, you don't even know what you're counting. <laughs> Right. And so you would hope either one or two things, that they set the goal, the bar is so low that the fact that you didn't know isn't going to materially affect your ability to reach the goal, or they will give us, you know, a little bit of flexibility in the reporting period. And that way, in effect, it's not going to be retroactive. Here's your rule. You still have another month to get your act together. <laughs> now go start measuring. And uh, everything I hear is that there is this recognition that with only 12% of doctors achieving meaningful use stage two, that although the goals were entirely noble, that the bar was set too high. The analogy I use is by, in some ways, you know, interoperability we know is real important, real critical, should be a part of the meaningful use program. But if I tell you, you must buy a car, but by the way, the roads don't exist yet, probably not that great a car. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And so I've argued to some of our policymakers, love the goals, but make sure the ecosystem is ready and only then hold people accountable for the result. So I think they're hearing us. And this, this next question kind of relates to what you've just been talking about. So we have some figures of 12% of and I think 40% they said on the hospitals of testing to meaningful use too. <clears throat> that right there is, is a little interesting to me. So, for example, you're out there and you know that the rule you have to attest to is going to be revised. I would think almost everybody would say, well, why am I going to bother doing this now? Uh, I'll just wait and see the revision, especially if the bar is fairly high. So for those folks that have attested, I mean, are they just way above and beyond? They're saying, hey, I don't care if they, if they downgrade any of these things. We can do all these things right now. Is that kind of what we could say about the people who have it tested if they, do, if they do pass, you know, if they are actually doing the things they say they're doing? They are quite advanced. Yeah, I mean, I think the issue, of course, is your level of maturity based on what might even be random chance. So in our case, Beth Israel Deaconess went live with a patient health record in 1999. So we've already been at 25% of our patients sending secure messages, viewing their lab and their notes and all the rest since 1999. So, so hey, 5%, you know, that's whatever, it's not going to be a lift. <laughs> but mm -hmm. most organizations, and again, this was sort of random chance and happenstance that we did this PHR in 1999. If you just introduced a PHR two years ago, chances are your patients and their families don't really understand its value, don't really have the education that's necessary to get you to the 5%. So, you know, on the one hand, you could say, oh, it's because these are organizations that put in the thoughtful planning and they just knew what the future would demand and they were ahead of the curve. I think it's more likely just luck. Okay. Okay. Would you expect to see a big jump um, based on the, the theory, my theory, that a lot of people just said, I'm just going to be revised. Why am I going to bother now? I'll just wait. So once the revision comes out, you might see all those people finally saying, okay, now I'm ready to go. Well, the thing I worry about is the workaround, the check the box, get it done, but don't actually achieve the desired result. And so let me just give you two or three examples. 
So suppose Mrs. Smith is a 98-year-old person you're discharging from the hospital to a nursing home, and you say, hey, Mrs. Smith, we have this cool new feature called a PHR, and as you exit the hospital, I am going to sit at your bedside and have you click on a page. See, you just accessed your record. Have a nice day. I mean, you could check the box, but really, is that the intent? Did you really empower that patient to have fluid access to their data and use it? And so I just, I worry that sometimes as we've made these regulations, the goals and the spirit were appropriate, but maybe the measures need to be refined. And that's where I mentioned as the Senate is thinking about some bills, don't measure the fact that the functionality is there and one patient did it, really do a thoughtful, objective survey of what the patients themselves actually experienced. Another example for you is the selfie, right? We hear that CMS said it's okay for you to send a discharge summary from yourself to yourself as long as a person reads it with a different license. So the hospital has one license. An eligible professional has a different license. So therefore, look, we have interoperability between two different licensed entities. And of course, again, that was not the regulatory intent. <laughs> right. So you hope too, as the Senate thinks through, the incentives of paying people for keeping patients well, what we're gonna see is a significant upswell of interoperability when people recognize they'll only be paid if care is coordinated. And so they're going to send data across the community to those who need it to ensure that patients aren't readmitted, the patients stay in their homes and they're healthy and preventative care is delivered. So a long answer to your question, I think that you'll really see the significant shift in interoperability once the incentives are aligned to share data because there's a business need. Very good. Next question uh, from the audience. We are still getting our act together and need to prioritize what workflows we work on. Example, family history, clinical summaries for transitions of care, secure messages from patients. What do you think is most important? Sure. And you know, if I look at where those 12% of doctors, why only 12%? It's typically because the secure messaging and the various patient family engagement, you know, look at my record, hasn't gone, uh, you know, the uptake has not been as great as was hoped or as fast as was hoped. So that seems to be the area that is going to be revised. So I think it's incredibly important to engage patients and families, but if there's something that you could guess is going to be reduced in scope, at least for the next year, it's probably those elements. So, you know, make sure the things you can control, patient family history, the data gathering, the sending of transition to care summaries, you know, get those done and then continue to educate your patients, mm -hmm. establish those workflows, knowing you probably will going to have, you have a little more time on the patient family engagement provisions. Okay, next question. Can you talk a little bit about whether you think pragmatic innovation in healthcare IT is possible and if so, in which areas? Sure, and so the example that I gave you about mm -hmm. my hypertension diagnosis, well, let me give you another one. The FDA has approved an EKG machine that is an iPhone case, right? So a live core, I don't have any stock in this company, I have no financial relationship whatsoever. So how often do you have a halter monitor on your body? Oh, one day a year when the cardiologist wants to look for an arrhythmia. How often do you have your phone on your body? That would probably be about 20 hours a day, 365 days a year. So what's the likelihood of capturing the arrhythmia on your phone versus a halter monitor? Pretty high. So I have a SVT, an atrial tachycardia. For 15 years, no cardiologist has been able to diagnose it because they could never capture it. It just never happened when I was on a treadmill or wearing a device but I purchased the Alive Core iPhone case. And what do you know? My arrhythmia happened when I was carrying my phone, and within one minute, my cardiologist had it and said, oh, I see P waves. It's an atrial tachycardia with a rate of 160. You need 25 milligrams of metoprolol, and you'll be completely cured. 
So there is a perfect example of current status quo technology failed. And an innovative company that decided to create an EKG machine in your iPhone case, which by the way is $70 on Amazon, <laughs> uh, suddenly now makes a diagnosis possible and within, without even going to a doctor's office. I'm fully treated, all because my phone did it. Mm -hmm. It is possible. Okay, next question. Some vendors are touting high levels of MU2 attestation rates among their client base, especially relative to the rate you quoted. How much of this is a vendor usability issue versus the need for final guidelines? And I think what has been highlighted in that question is that the EHRs that we have in America today were mostly created to abide by regulatory and compliance requirements and to ensure that the billing process was done legally and effectively. They weren't optimized for usability, for the obvious, oh, click here, buddy, or how do I get through my day faster, or to support team-based care. So what I think, I mean, from my looking at the data, those vendors that have moved to things like cloud-based platforms, web-based platforms, mobile-based platforms, collaboration kinds of platforms, have tended to achieve higher levels of attestation for exactly the reason the question was asked, which is they're far more usable, easier to deploy. It doesn't require that I'm sitting in the doctor's office on a dedicated workstation. I can be using my phone while in the nursing home or while, you know, having dinner with my family if I get an urgent call or whatever. Uh, so I believe, you know, the future does belong to the cloud and mobile and social kinds of EHRs and our client server type EHRs of locally hosted licensed software will diminish over time because they are harder to use. Okay, very good. Uh, what are your thoughts on ONC's federal health IT strategic plan and how do you think these recommendations will influence rulemaking? Right, and so the federal strategic plan was put together by taking 25 federal departments and asking each one of them what their goals were and then trying to knit together this synthesized version of, well, if we only did these things, the whole federal government and all of society would benefit. So. I thought ONC did a pretty reasonable job at creating a set of prioritized tasks that enable us to focus. And I think just a really interesting challenge is at the same time you have all these things that are clearly good, we have reimbursement changes that are taking place and things like global capitated risk which requires care management and the uh, uh, what I'll call new kind of software that layers on top of electronic health records that supports care traffic control and care navigation. Those things aren't precisely in the federal strategic plan. So I guess the only concern I have is, sure, the goals are synthesized, well stated, and provide a good roadmap, but let's make sure that as we revise our payment system that the IT is aligned uh, between these two projects, the federal projects, and the realignment of reimbursement. Very good. Uh, next question, if stage three continues as planned, do you think we'll continue to see a drop off of physician practices that attest to meaningful use? I do. And so the challenge, of course, is, uh, I think Intermountain Healthcare illustrated this. They say, well, what is the cost of complying with the rule? versus the cost of not complying with the rule. And I think it is really true in today's world where we are trying to do so much with so little so fast, the meaningful use dollars may actually be very, very small as compared to, in our case, Massachusetts with what we call our alternative quality contract. A lot of our private payers are following this global capitated risk idea they, you know, they're going to pay you to take on risk, and ooh, if you can't actually survive, it's an existential question. I better do the IT necessary for my pay for performance and global capitated risk, or I'm out of business versus meaningful use. Oh, well, you know, that's a million dollar penalty. I'll just take the million dollar penalty. <laughs> so I think it's probably true that people will start asking the cost benefit 
uh, value of the meaningful use program as it goes forward and potentially drop out. Right. The, the idea that the Precision me Medicine Initiative is replacing meaningful use as a driver in the industry uh, sounds like we think and you think that is a good thing. Well, so the example I gave about my wife is just one issue. Um, I was trained as a doctor 30 years ago, and uh, I trained in the county hospitals of Los Angeles. Um, I was told that whenever a patient walks in with community-acquired pneumonia, you give them erythromycin because it's cheap. Because in county hospitals, the budgets were very, very low, and what you wanted to do was not necessarily maximize convenience, you wanted to minimize cost. And so why did I give erythromycin? Well, it's because the hospital and my chief resident told me to. Well, if any of you have taken erythromycin, you know it probably makes you feel horrible. You feel <laughs> nauseous. Mm -hmm. Why would anyone take erythromycin? Go take a Z-Pack, Zithromax, far better. Oh, but it's $8 a pill. Well, shouldn't, as a society, every doctor deliver the right care to the right patient at the right time based on an objective set of evidence? And I think ultimately then we would avoid redundant, unnecessary care and side effects and complications and hospital-acquired conditions and all these other things. So yes, I believe that if instead of being trained as apprentices and artists, <laughs> we simply followed cloud-hosted decision support that was available to all clinicians inside their EHR from nationally curated evidence, that quality would improve and costs would go down. Well, very good, very good. I think that's uh, about all we had time for today. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Halamka for once again uh, giving this invaluable update to the industry. Uh, we look forward to his next appearance in December. <laughs> I want to thank our sponsor, um, On Base by Highland, and thank Lorna Green for joining us and delivering the sponsor message. We appreciate their support. As I mentioned, we recorded this event and we'll post it to our YouTube channel within two days, if not sooner. You'll get an email when it's ready. Uh, and also, attending our events gets you one CEU towards the CHIME CHCIO certification. If you've asked us to let CHIME know of your attendance, we will. And if not, please let CHIME know you are here. Sponsorship opportunities, contact Nancy Wilcox. Questions, comments, you can reach me, and you can go to our site to view our robust upcoming webinar schedule. So once again, I want to thank Dr. Halamka, Lorna, on base by Highland, and all our attendees. Everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you.